All right, this one's called Idols. Idols, where are all the idols? I've been fortunate enough to travel around different parts of the world, the earth. Some people would say globe. Um, flat earthers would not. Whichever way you look at it, I've been to different continents and seen different cultures and watched and listened. So what did I see? I see in one continent, like Europe, there's a lot of Mary worship or goddess. And then in other places they have temples and shrines to certain goddesses or their own name for it in their culture. But it seems almost universal that the whole world is covered with different idols. And statues and shrines and worship of everything but worshiping Jesus and Father God. I went to a mountain and there's shrines built all over it. And it's a mountain that's to a fox god, you know, the animal of a fox. And they have statues all over the mountain of a fox. And different shrines to different gods to different idols is almost universal across the continents, but instead of one place it's called a temple, the other one's called a church, the other one's called a shrine. All man's inventions of the house of God, where God says that we are the temple, the vessel of God, having the Holy Spirit live inside of us. It's not made of the earth in, in the sense of its spirit. Well, the temples, the buildings, the shrines, the what other mosque, any name you want to pick of making a holy building towards God, where God has made the building already. We are clay. He's made us. He chose us before the foundation of the earth. Wrote our name in a book, the book of life. And he says it will have power over the enemy, the evil one, Satan, and the demons. No, he will crush them under our feet with his power. But we'll be the willing vessels being used. So, realistically, these idols, churches, synagogues, other places, that are man's way of getting to God through works, is in all the different cultures, humanity is trying to get back to God, whether they realize it or not, and some absolutely just will never turn to God. They are vessels made for destruction, so God can show his power. And also the vessels of mercy that he can show his love and goodness for eternity. So it's a choice again, good or evil. In Deuteronomy, uh, or Exodus 20, where it talks about, hey, Ten Commandments. You know, it says, I'm your Lord, your God brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Does that talk to the Jews and the Israelites? That it actually happened? Yes, he did. Yes. It's a historical event. It's a fact. Even if it is written in the Bible, it was done. So he bought them out of land of Egypt, which is pretty much earth and sin. And what? Out of the house of bondage. We are in spiritual bondage when we're born. And we don't know the difference. We don't know any better. So only God can wake us up. Touch us on the head. Poo, hey, wake up. Right? 
and then our eyes are open. And then, if we're lucky, our ears are open. And all the time, it's your heart that's opening and love is pouring out. Does that sound like a hippy dippy idea? Well, it's God's idea. That love conquers all. All sin. So that seems like a good idea. So he's going to take us out of sin and bondage. Bondage to what? Whatever you let in. You shall have no other gods before me. No other. Just him. Oh. Right? You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. So there's heaven above and the earth beneath. He's showing levels and layers. And the waters underneath the earth. So you shall not bow down to them or to serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Third and fourth generation. Of those who hate me. So the punishment, the curse, however you want to look at it, is not just to one individual that's doing it. It can affect your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids. But here's the kicker. Wait it for it at the end. But showing mercy to thousands and to those who love me and keep my commandments. So... Exactly the same. You will not bow down to any other god or idol or anything else. He is a jealous God. He wants you all to himself. To have a relationship. To be BFFs forever. Right? So he's telling you. Here's my rules. Here's what's expected. Why? Because he created you. He's setting up the rules. It's his playbook. It's his Bible. It's his journal. It's his diary. He writes a story. All we do is turn pages. So then, if he's saying, I don't want all these other things in your life, and don't make them for you either. Now, right now, we have idols everywhere. In Asia, they had the temples and shrines. In Europe, they had cathedrals um, and some mosques because of different occupations at different times in history. So, what else? Deuteronomy, let me see. Moving on, can't find it. My bad, sorry. But in Revelations, what do we see? People that don't worship the idols, that don't follow the path of the entity, Lucifer, Satan, that's controlling the whole entire world and the whole system that's in there to keep you in slavery. Slave to money, slave to fame, slave to, slave to riches, powers, you know, being powerful. All of it boils down to two. Absolutely just two. Just like Jesus boiled down the Ten Commandments into two. Love your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your body. And love your neighbor as yourself. Which covers all ten of the commandments. We can also see that for the choices you make, there's consequences of punishment or... 
grace, mercy, and rewards. So Revelation 7, 9. And these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number. That's a lot of people. Nobody could number them, right? Of all the nations, tribes, and peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. That means God is picking souls all over the world at any given day to do His will because they decided that His will is better than theirs because they don't want to run their lives or live their lives or at least have some purpose for something better than themselves. Love. And if Father can use you even though we do wrong and we turn or repent, however, whatever word you want to use, we stop doing evil and we start turning to God and saying, what do you want me to do? How can I serve you? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of all the universe, the Alpha, the beginning, the Omega, the end, He's it in a full nutshell. And all you got to do is say, how can I make you happy today? What do you want me to do? It's like when you're a little kid, three, four, two, my parents, what can I do to make them happy? If they're good, loving kids. Some kids could care less. Those are the vessels of clay made by the potter, some for mercy, some for damnation. But even that little kid is like, they want brownie points, they want hugs, they want love, they want kisses, they want, you know, reassurances. And a good old pat on the back, you know, good job, proud of you. It goes a long way. And it comes from your heart and should be loved. So then, God's taking from all these different countries and nations and tongues and languages from everywhere and using them for His glory and His greatness. They're standing before the throne and the Lamb. We are standing in front of a throne with Jesus sitting on it. In the spirit world, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands. So when we're standing in front of Jesus, He's at the throne. We have palm trees in our hands and we're clothed in a white robe. His mercy, His blood covers us to make us clean. So we're justified, sanctified, and soon to be rectified back to Him. And what we're doing, crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Well, that's glory to our God, Jesus, sitting on the throne. A lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. So there's not just us. There's angels, and there's elders, and there's four living creatures. And they all fell to their face in front of this throne. Now is that going to be a sight to see? In some ways it'd be like, I'd be scared this. But it's also, think of just how amazing it's going to be with the love and the joy of the Father and Jesus filling the room like a sunshine opening and peeking through a window. We don't understand it now, but 2020 is hindsight, isn't it? So when we're on the other side, standing in front, in front of the throne of Jesus, clothed in white robes with palm branches in our hands, How cool is that going to be? I don't think we could make anything better here on earth than what God can make it in heaven. So what do they say? They fall down and worship. And these creatures and these elders and the angels all around next to us. Saying, what are we saying? Amen, blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be to our God forever and ever. Amen. He brought us into his world, his realm, heaven, 
so that we can stand blameless before him, not by our works, not what we've done, but by his mercy, because he shed his blood for us to cover our sins and to redeem us. And our response should be, Thanks. How can I be of use to you today? Because you've done all that for me. What can you do? Tell people the good news. There's a way out. You can open your eyes. You can open your ears. You can have a relationship with our Creator. And you can share it with others. Because that's the whole point. It's good news. It's a gospel. It means it's done. Satan's finished. He just hasn't been put in the box yet. And Jesus is coming back to finish it. But before he does, Satan gets to make a big mess down here. And the only way you can be saved is crying out to Jesus. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through him. He's the key. He's the door. He's the way. He's the narrow path. There is no other name given to man by which he may be saved except by Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He's the guy. This is the way to get to heaven. Everything else is distractions and BS. So, if you want to be standing before the throne of Jesus in this really cool spirit world with angels and elders and four living creatures and they're all bowing down and, and worshiping Jesus because it's his power, it's his might, it's his, it's his honor, and it's forever. And it says that every knee shall bow. That's every knee. Lucifer, the fallen angels, all the other creatures, or whatever else is out there in the universe, we don't know. But they're either for him or against him. And the ones that are against them, you guys lose. You've already lost. You're done. The best thing you could do is repent, turn from evil, turn from disobeying God, do his will, do what he wants. And then share how he's had mercy and kindness in your life. Even though you deserved the worst, just like Barabbas and Jesus, you know, and only one could be set free by Pontius Pilate, and the Jews said, give us Barabbas as a, as a redemption, you know, but crucify Jesus Christ. Because they did, and because he did, we can go to heaven. It was all planned. God knew it from the beginning when he started this whole process. In his book of life, he knew which people were the overcomers and turn from their lives to Jesus. So it's not too late. So I would say, make the right decision Choose Jesus and life, not hell and death and torment forever. Nobody really wants to hear this, but it's the truth. So, align your perspective with the absolute truth, which is Jesus Christ. What he did that you can't do in order to get yourself into heaven. So, it's free to you. And I'm going to read this one thing that I picked up in another country. It says, God, and I won't say the name because it's way too long, is enshrined in the center of this uh, octagon-type building. It says, the zodiac animals are arranged towards each direction. You may pray to an animal of the year of your birth or your zodiac sign or your lucky direction. Of the year. So right then, here we go, praying to zodiac animals, praying to this God that's encased or enclosed in this building, and then you can have your choice. 
pray to the zodiac sign, pray to the animal of the year, or pray to your lucky direction. And at the very bottom, which seems so funny, ironic I mean, may the blessings of God be upon you. You're praying to idols and you want the blessings of God. And he tells you, I'm a jealous God, I want you. And I want you to want me in sincerity, in love, in heart, that you really, really want to be with him. And forget everything else. Forsake it all. Give it up. There's a pearl in that field over there. Go buy the land. So it's making the good choice, not the wrong choice. So read the word. Ask for guidance. Ask for help. Ask how you can do something for someone else that day by doing God's will. So, make a choice. Choose God or choose the alternative. I would choose Jesus every single time. It's not an easy choice. Is it the right choice? Absolutely. There is no other choice. So choose wisely. Red, blue, blue, blue. Which pill are you going to take? Red or blue? It's up to you.